Germany emerged from the First World War broken and disillusioned, defeat in the Great War heralded the end of the monarchy, with the Kaiser giving way to the Weimar Republic, named after the small German city that had once been a hotbed of both artistic and scientific progress. Before long American money was pouring into the new-look country, and people weren't afraid to spend it. Whether because they wanted to simply forget the trauma of the war or because they realized that such peace and relative prosperity was bound to come to an end sooner rather than later, the German people partied hard. Indeed, from 1923 onwards, the golden age of the Weimar Republic was characterized by its decadent parties just as much as it was for its economic troubles and weak governments. The cabaret scene of 1920s Berlin is still famous to this day. Here in dance halls and cabaret clubs, the old rules were tossed aside. Prussian conservatism gave way to sexual liberation, equality and hedonism. Gender rules were not just bent but smashed altogether. Indeed, some of the things that went on would even be shocking today. So, from drugs and sex to underage prostitution, gangsters and murders, here are some of the most scandalous aspects of this decadent decade. Number 1. Cocaine was all the rage, though other drugs were legal and helped fuel the decade-long party. Germans famously loved their beer, but during the heady days of the Weimar Republic, the decadent nightlife of Berlin in particular was fueled by something a lot stronger. Quite simply, the city was awash with drugs, and people of all ages were happy to experiment. Cocaine was the number one stimulant though many people also enjoyed heroin, while tranquilizers were also taken by many, especially those who needed extra stimulation to keep up at the city's many crazed parties. To some extent, the rise in drug taking was down to the fact that many of the things the Germans had been used to getting a kick out of were no longer available. Under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, signed at the end of the First World War, Germany lost its overseas colonies as well as some important international trade routes. Tea and tobacco supplies dried up almost overnight. Luckily, other pick-me-ups were soon readily available. Almost all drugs, including cocaine and heroin, were legal to buy, and it was said that you could buy them on most Berlin streets during the 1920s. Incredibly, Weimar Germany ended up the sole consumer of Peruvian cocaine, while 80% of all the coke made by domestic pharmaceuticals ended up going up the nostrils of Berliners. Nightclubs and cabarets were also good places to get your fix. Indeed, in Weimar, Berlin, some of the most notorious establishments even gave their customers drugs upon entering. At the time, such rampant drug use was not seen to be problematic. Quite the opposite, in fact. With Germany still suffering both physically and emotionally from the Great War, countless veterans were being prescribed morphine and even heroin in order to help them deal with their pain. Even people who hadn't been to the front felt a need to get out of their heads and try and forget the national trauma. It was only much later that drug use became linked to addiction, by that point, of course, the good times of the Weimar Republic were over. Even then, however, drugs carried on fueling German society. Indeed, recent research into the Third Reich has revealed the extent to which huge numbers of Nazi soldiers were given methamphetamine, with the regime using hard drugs to try and fuel their bid for world domination. Number 2. Prostitution was deregulated and tens of thousands of women sold their bodies during the heady days of the Weimar Republic. The end of the First World War left many Germans financially ruined. Many flocked to the big cities in order to try and make a living. From 1920 onwards the size of Berlin grew by a factor of 13. Almost overnight it became a teeming metropolis, and a party place for the relative few who could afford it. Of course, there was a darker side to the decadence. Lots of those who moved to Berlin and other big cities in search of work struggled to find it. Inevitably, many women felt they had no choice but to sell their bodies in order to survive. Prostitution boomed. Towards the end of the war, the German government had moved to legalize prostitution. Since many soldiers had been returning to the front after a few days leave in the city suffering the effects of sexually transmitted diseases, the authorities set up legal and approved brothels. 
What's more, soldiers were even given coupons to use in these establishments in the hope that they would at least remain disease-free. Once the war was over, huge numbers of young men moved back to the big cities. Many of them were frustrated and traumatized, and most no longer saw anything wrong with using the services of a prostitute. In Berlin many prostitutes worked on the streets. Moreover, as the famous journalist Hans Ostwald remarked at the time, most dance halls are nothing but markets for prostitution. Many of the dancing girls in the cabaret bars and dance halls could be taken home, or just into a back room, for the right price. Of course, once the effects of the Wall Street crash hit the Weimar Republic, the right price plummeted almost overnight. The newspapers of the time reported that street prostitutes ended up turning tricks in exchange for food rather than worthless paper money. There were even instances of mother and daughter teams working together in order to survive. Almost overnight, prostitution once again became seedy and disreputable. Number 3. Prostitution was like a candy shop, whatever you wanted, you could find on the streets of Berlin and in the city's cabaret bars. Nobody can say for sure how many women turned to prostitution during the days of the Weimar Republic. What is almost certain is that the majority of them, and not just in Berlin, were women in their 20s or 30s who had been made widows as a result of the First World War and so were desperate to make some money any way they could. However, these were by no means the only ladies on offer to men happy to pay for sex. Indeed, the history books show that, when it came to prostitution in Weimar Germany, almost anything went. A whole new vocabulary emerged in 1920s Berlin, for example, with specialist words and terms for different girls and different sexual services. A man might want to enjoy the company of a half-silk, for instance, that is a woman who worked in an office or shop by day and then sold her body on occasional weekends or evenings. And there were the nuts, boyish teenage girls who often turned tricks after school or even munsies, heavily pregnant ladies who would wait for clients under lampposts on the street. There was even a market for so-called gravestones, women who didn't fit the accepted definition of beauty. A man could pay for a woman missing limbs, with severe burns or with any other deformity. Again, thanks to the Great War, there was no shortage of gravestones for men who got their kicks this way to choose from. For the more discerning gentlemen, there was a variety of high-class hookers to choose from, almost all of them working out of clubs or hotels rather than making a living on the streets. So-called voses, the French word for vagina, would advertise their services in newspapers and magazines, while half-beavers were ladies of good breeding who worked in high-class brothels during the afternoon or early evenings, but never late at night. But it was in the dance halls and cabaret venues where things were really crazy. In some establishments, if you booked an expensive table for an evening, a table lady would be included in the price. Almost always the most beautiful girls, and, invariably, they were also chosen for their cultured demeanor as well as their looks, in the venue these would be yours for the whole evening. Number 4. Desperate men also turned to prostitution, and Berlin even became a tourism hotspot for Europe's homosexual gentlemen. After the end of the war, young men flocked to Berlin in their thousands. Most of them were desperate to find work and, when they couldn't get a job in a factory or on a building site, they found work in the city's booming prostitution scene. According to some social historians, many men had enjoyed homosexual experiences in the trenches during the First World War and, their curiosity well and truly piqued, were keen to enjoy their new freedom as much as possible. Combined with the general air of liberty and open-mindedness in Berlin from 1920 onwards, this meant that homosexuality became increasingly tolerated, including the presence of male prostitutes on the streets of the capital. It wasn't just great war veterans who were turning tricks in Berlin, as well as in Hamburg. One contemporary writer noted, every high school boy wanted to earn some money and in the dimly lit bars, one might see government officials and men of the world of finance tenderly courting drunken sailors without any shame. As well as selling themselves on the streets, male prostitutes would advertise their services in specialist newspapers and journals. According to one study, 
as many as 30 homosexual publications could be found on a typical Berlin kiosk, at height of the Weimar Republic. These magazines might also feature adverts for private detectives, many gay men were victims of attempted blackmail and there was a huge market for detectives capable of finding out who might be behind such a scam. The booming male prostitution industry meant that Berlin became a magnet for sex tourists. Men from across Europe, above all from Britain and Scandinavia, as well as from Russia, flocked to the German capital to enjoy the company of other men, and they were happy to pay for the privilege. Some American men also traveled to Berlin and indulged in the city's many vices. The American architect Philip Johnson, widely regarded as one of the country's finest ever architectural minds, admitted to using male prostitutes and praised the openness of Berlin during the Weimar years. Number 5. Androgyny was all the rage as young people defined the gender norms and enjoyed shocking older conservatives through their dress and behavior. In the dance halls and cabaret clubs of Weimar Germany, some of the most popular acts were male and female impersonators. Cross-dressing was huge as people of all ages and from all social backgrounds made the most of their newfound freedom and experimented with their fashion and sexuality. Indeed, at almost every party you might expect to find women dressed in top hats and tails or men in cocktail dresses, as well as intersex individuals known as hermaphrodites. Cross-dressing was legal in Berlin during the Weimar years, but that didn't mean all sections of society accepted it. As such, it was largely restricted to clubs, bars and other private venues. However, it was hardly a secret phenomenon. In respectable magazines and newspapers, adverts specifically aimed at the cross-dressing community were regularly on display, promising everything from plus-size elegant gowns to wigs and other accessories. What's more, cross-dressing prostitutes were also all the rage, and many were well-known celebrities on the cabaret circuit and charged huge amounts for their company. Almost from the very start of the Weimar Republic, cross-dressing went from being seen as an unhealthy perversion to something to be understood and even celebrated. In 1919, Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld opened the Institute for Sexual Science, a truly revolutionary organization, he not only offered counseling to both female and male cross-dressers but carried out pioneering research into this area of human sexuality. Moreover, Dr. Hirschfeld offered hormone treatments, helping, for instance, men become more feminine or women more masculine. He also pioneered some of the earliest gender reassignment surgeries. The Institute for Sexual Science helped make German society more tolerant of cross-dressers, it issued transvestite passes, to be shown to the police to prove that a person was not perverted or a deviant. This meant that cross-dressers and intersex performers could work and walk the streets without fear of harassment, though, of course, the reality was not everyone in Berlin was so progressive and understanding as Dr. Hirschfeld and his colleagues. Number 6. Cabaret wasn't all fun and decadence, as the shockingly dark, Satirical Ballad of the Dead Soldier Showed The people of the Weimar Republic liked to have a good time. Indeed, for many people, the decadent parties, drugs and sex served as a way of not thinking about the darker side of life, and in particular about the horrors of the First World War. But that doesn't mean that it all entertainment was completely frivolous. There was a deeper side to cabaret, with performers mixing silliness and eroticism with darker messages about German society and politics. In 1920s Berlin, no subject was off-limits. Both on the stage and in the audience of the biggest dance and cabaret halls, politicians were routinely criticized and ridiculed. When Adolf Hitler emerged onto the political scene, he was routinely mocked. But he wasn't the only one. The left-wing political titan Friedrich Ebert was also subjected to widespread ridicule, though mostly for his weight than for his beliefs and policies. By the mid-1920s, most of the comedians performing on Berlin's stages included at least some satire or political observations in their material. It wasn't all about having a good time. Most famously of all, Bertolt Brecht, arguably Germany's most celebrated man of letters of the time, scandalized Berlin society by reminding the city's partygoers of the grimness of recent history. 
in January of 1922, Brecht performed his Ballad of the Dead Soldier in a popular night spot. It was a tale set in the First World War. In it, the German army, running low on manpower, decides to dig up the body of a dead soldier. They load the deceased young man's body with schnapps and cover it with incense to mask the smell and then send him back to the front to fight and die all over again. In a city that tolerated drugs and even child prostitution, this was an outrage too far. Brecht would only perform the work for six nights before ditching it completely. Number 7. The men of Weimar were wild, but the women often wilder and Anita Berber might well have been the craziest of them all. Weimar-era Berlin had more than its fair share of crazy characters. But arguably the craziest of them all was a petite young woman. Anita Berber was, for many, the epitome of 1920s style. What's more, she also epitomized the liberal and experimental nature of the Weimar Republic. To her fans, Berber was a pioneer. To her detractors, however, she was presented as evidence that Germany had lost its moral compass in the years following the First World War, and her death at the age of just 29 was presented as proof that the nation needed to clean up its act. Born in Leipzig in 1899, Berber was raised by her grandmother. While her parents may not have been around much, since her father was a top violinist and her mother an occasional actress, the young Anita did at least inherit a love of show business from them. As a result, she moved to Berlin at the age of 16, determined to make it as a cabaret dancer. For a couple of years, she danced in cabaret shows, slowly making a name for herself. And then, when the war ended, and the Weimar Republic was founded, she really exploded onto the scene. By the end of 1918, she was also dancing in movie too, much to the delight of her growing army of fans. It wasn't just her dress sense that made Berber so shocking, though her short bobbed hair, often painted red, and androgynous style certainly outraged many conservative Berliners. Rather, it was her habit of dancing completely nude or her determination not to hide her bisexuality. Berber had toured affairs with artists and actors, both male and female. What's more, she was a raging alcoholic and rampant drug user. According to the legend, she started each day with a breakfast of chloroform and ether and then would steadily progress to cocaine, morphine, and heroin. Even though she managed to clean up, ditching alcohol altogether by 1928, a few months later she was dead from severe tuberculosis. Weimar Germany had lost its ultimate icon, even if there were plenty of other women determined to take her place. Thanks to her movies, as well as the fact she was the muse and model for some of the era's leading artists, including Otto Dix, she remains the poster child of the time, a groundbreaking hedonist who to this day continues to divide opinion. Number 8. Marlene Dietrich made a name for herself as an icon of the Weimar era before she headed to Hollywood and global fame. Before she became a Hollywood superstar in the 1930s, Marlene Dietrich made a name for herself as an actress and socialite during the heady days of Weimar era Berlin. As an extrovert and as a bisexual, she thrived in the liberal atmosphere of 1920s Berlin. Indeed, one newspaper dubbed Dietrich perhaps the busiest and most passionate bisexual in theatrical Berlin, quite an accolade given the competition. Her exploits made her as infamous as she was famous, and soon she became almost as well known for her colorful private life as she was for her movie career. Dietrich had just turned 20 when she started making a name for herself in Berlin. Like many future stars, she started out as a chorus girl, progressing to bit parts in cabaret shows and then movies. Though she married fellow actor Rudolf Sieber in 1923, even having a daughter with him, this didn't slow her down. In fact, Sieber was well aware of her nature and she was open about the numerous affairs she conducted with both men and women. Even for Weimar Berlin, Dietrich's behavior was often seen as shocking, especially her love of women. Klaus Kinski, one of Germany's biggest ever movie stars, recalled in his biography how Dietrich's passionate affair with actress Edith Edwards was particularly scandalous. In his autobiography, Kinski writes breathlessly, 
Marlene tore down Edith's panties backstage in a Berlin theater and, using just her mouth, brought Edith to orgasm. Such behavior certainly didn't hinder her career. In 1929, Dietrich landed the lead role in Lola Lola and then starred in The Blue Angel. This brought her to the attention of Hollywood and, within a year, she had moved to the United States, where she soon became a genuine A-lister. Number 9. Child prostitutes could easily be found in 1920s Berlin, so long as you knew where to look and what code words to use. As we've seen, Weimar Germany was a hotbed of sex, much of it of the paid-for variety. Both adult men and women sold their bodies in the streets and clubs of Berlin, but child prostitutes were also bought and sold here. In fact, there was a booming and well-regulated industry, with pimps happy to cater to almost any taste, quite simply if you knew where to go and, just as importantly, what to ask for, the chances are, you could get it, no questions asked. In downtown Berlin, some pharmacists peddled a side trade in child prostitutes. These boys and girls were prescribed as medicine. If you knew where to go, you simply told the chemist you wanted some medicine. You would also tell him how long you had been ill for. This was all part of a not-so-elaborate ruse if you said you had been ill for 13 years, then the pimp knew you wanted a 13-year-old girl. Similarly, if you requested red pills, he would try and procure a redhead for you. In most cases, the pharmacist would know exactly where to take a prospective client and would deliver him to the appropriate club or apartment. At the same time, young prostitutes could also be ordered like a takeaway pizza. Pimps would place advertisements in newspapers and magazines. If you knew what you were looking for, the code was simple enough to crack. Then all you needed to do was phone the number given and a telephone girl, that is a child between the ages of 12 to 17 would be delivered right to your home or hotel room. Such telephone girls, almost always advertised as virgins, with their physical attributes hinted at through references to female movie stars, were often the most expensive prostitutes in all of Weimar Germany, with only rich businessmen or film stars able to afford their niche services. Number 10. It wasn't all about the Kit Kat Club. In fact, Berlin alone had 900 nightclubs, many of them hot spots of jazz, drugs and sex. For many, the Kit Kat Club was the epicenter of Weimar era Berlin. The club arguably the city's leading entertainment venue and was made famous by Liza Minnelli in the hit musical Cabaret. But the Kit Kat Club was far from the only place Berliners could let their hair down. In fact, the records show that, by 1930, some 899 venues with a dancing license were registered in the German capital. Many of these were just as decadent as the world-famous Kit Kat Club, if not more so. The Mocha Empty Nightclub, for example, was one of the crazier places in town. Now made famous again thanks to the massively popular Babylon Berlin books as well as the TV series of the same name, the venue was completely over the top, it had its own barber shop, pastry shop and billiard hall, while there was also a room full of typists ready to take dictation for businessmen or journalists needing to take a break from their partying to do some work. While there was no members-only brothel on site, it's believed that the Mocha FD was still a hotbed of prostitution, with many of the beautiful dancing girls, and boys, happy to go home with a client for the right price. Other infamous Berlin venues of the time included the Haus Vaterland, a known hangout of gangsters as well as prostitutes, drug addicts and bohemians. Haus Vaterland was known as a palace of pleasure, with the interiors modeled on everything from ancient Egypt to Moorish Spain via the Orient Express. Clients would spend whole days there, sometimes even two or three days. Of course, there were plenty of ways they could keep awake, as well as the cocaine and other drugs, legend has it that the house Vaterland was selling up to 25,000 cups of coffee on a single day, 